Okay, so let's have a look at how to make Marlow contracts using the Marlow Playground. In particular, we are going to use Blockly because it's the very friendly, very beginner friendly way of, of, of starting. And it's also very intuitive. So I'm going to open an empty Blockly project by clicking here, just to show you the, the basic constructs, the basic blocks. You can see that for, for making a contract in Blockly, you just have to put um, blocks together and they feel like jigsaw puzzles. Uh, and uh, and it's very forgiving. For example, if you put the wrong block in the wrong place, it will just not fit. It will be kicked out. And there are other features like every construct with the same type has the same color. So all actions are yellow, all values are red, or contracts are purple. And also, if you don't know what block to put in a block, if you choose the outer block, you see a new a new category appears, and that's the category that fits in that in that hole, right? So here you have five holes, you get five categories, and, and each of them fits in the right in the corresponding in the corresponding hole, right? So Blockly gives you a lot of feedback about what you can do, about you about what you can't do. Okay, so let's look at the main building constructs. The main building construct for a contract is the contract construct. And there are six of them, but we are only going to look at three because these are the only ones that we are going to need for this exercise. So basically the when construct is used for waiting for a party, for one of the participants in the contract to do something. And the things that the party can do are actions. So there are three types of actions, the deposit, the choice, and the notification. Let's, let's forget about the notification for now. The deposit is just an opportunity for a participant to put assets into the contract. So for example, pay money to the contract. And something to keep in mind is that deposits are always made into an account. In particular, contracts always hold assets into accounts because when we, the contract finishes, we don't want anything left in the contract. So we classify assets into accounts because each party has an account in the contract. So by the end of the contract, whatever is in the party's account is refunded to the party. And that's how we make sure we know, well, close knows where, where to pay the assets that are in the contract. And that's how we make sure that there are no assets left in the contract. So when we do the deposit, we have the person that that makes the deposit, the amount that is going to be deposited, the currency that is going to be deposited, and also the account in which we want to make the deposit. And then what we want to happen afterwards. Another action that the participant can make is a choice. And this is when the, the contract wants the a party to say something. So for example, yeah, well, basically a party wants to make a choice. So do you want to do this? Do you want to do this or do you want to do that? Or what's your opinion about this? So that's that's done with the choice construct. And there's also a choice owner, which is the one that makes the choice. And we can put this into the one. So we can put several. And what the one does is it waits it waits for one of these actions to happen. For the first action to happen. So if a deposit is made first, then that's the one that's going to be used. If the choice is made first, then that's the one. And another important thing about the when is that it has a timeout. You can see here there is a date and a time. And that's because we cannot wait forever for a participant. Because if we did, then a participant could just not ever answer a when and then the money in the contract would be locked forever. So we cannot afford that. And we have a timeout for the when. And after that timeout happens, the contract will continue using the second gap. And on the other hand, we have the pay construct. And the pay construct can be used for two things, which are specified by this payee option. So basically, the pay, the pay construct decides what to do with assets which are already in the contract. 
So uh, you can see the PE construct, which is also here. It can be either an account or a party. So if we put an account here, we, if we put an account, pay will transfer from one account to another account. So basically we'll change the default refund party for some assets, which are already in the contract. Or alternatively, we can pay to a party. And this means that money or assets will be transferred from the contract to the party directly. So it will be transferred outside of the contract. And that's the that's the, the main the main blocks we need to think about right now. So let's have a look at the escrow. <clears throat> escrow contract is very very common financial contract, which is basically um, is 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 a way of holding money while a transaction is being carried out. So for example, imagine a buyer buys a bicycle from a seller, and uh, the buyer could put the money in escrow so that um, the money goes to the right person. So if the if the buyer gets the item, the money should go to the seller. But if the buyer doesn't get the, the item, then the money should be refunded. And the escrow is a mechanism for making sure this happens. So if the buyer, the buyer and the seller are asked whether they agree the transaction went smoothly, and if they disagree, then there is a third party which will decide is right. So let's have a look at the Blockly implementation. If we look at it, it seems like a very, very large contract, but let's split it in, in, in pieces. It's actually pretty simple. So I'm going to move this out of the way for now. <laughs> and here we can see just the when we looked at. This The first action in the contract is just a deposit done by the buyer, like we can see here and it's done into the account of the seller. The reason we deposit into the account of the seller is because if everything goes right, we expect the seller to get the money. And you can see the currency is ADA. This is the currency that we use by default in Cardano, but it could be something else. And we have the price, which could be the amount of money that is paid for the item. Something to consider here is that we have a constant parameter, but we could also have a constant directly. So we could already write here the, the price and put it here instead. So that, that would be fine. But the problem with this is that we cannot reuse this contract. We can only use it for things that are worth this amount. So instead we use constant parameter. And when the, what the constant parameter is, is that when we start the contract, it will ask us how much we want to put in the price instead of having it hard coded here. In the same spirit, we, we, you can see that we don't have a timeout here. We, we have a parameterized timeout, so not a constant one. And, and you could change this here as well. If you put constant, then you have actual concrete time and date where you want the timeout to happen. But again, we want to ask the user when we start the contract. So we put parameterized. So basically, um, we expect the buyer to make a deposit of the price and if the, if, the, if the buyer doesn't do it on time, then we just close and nothing happens. <clears throat> okay, if the buyer does deposit the money, then we expect the transaction to happen. And then by the end of the transaction, the buyer will be asked whether there was a problem. So there are two choices here, you can see. Either everything was all right. If everything was all right, then we close. And then because the money is in the seller's account, the seller will be refunded. But if the buyer says there is a problem, then we have to we have to mediate. So that's where the contract continues. So at this point, what we do is we transfer money from the seller's account to the buyer's account because now we suspect the buyer may be entitled to a refund. So that's what the payment does, and then we have another one. This time we ask seller for for their opinion. So either the seller may confirm the problem, if they do, then both the buyer and the seller agree, and this clause will make a refund because the money is now into the buyer's account. Notice that if the seller doesn't respond on time, then we also do close. So also the, 
the buyer would be refunded. But if the seller says there, there was there was no problem, it says the seller disputes that there is a problem, then we continue. And next, because the seller and the buyer disagree, we ask the mediator. So the mediator may dismiss the claim or confirm the, the, the problem. So if the mediator confirms the problem, so now that the seller and the buyer disagree, whatever the mediator say, says is what we are going to do. So if the mediator confirms the problem, we are refunding the, 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 the buyer, who is the one that has the, account, the money at the moment in the account. If the mediator says, they dismiss the claim, then we need to transfer money to the seller. So in this case, instead of transferring to an account, what we are doing is transferring to the seller directly. This would be the same because if we transfer to the account and then close, it would be the same effect. But here, just for, 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 for change, we are directly paying the seller because there is no longer any recourse. So that's why we are doing it directly. And again, from the account of the buyer, which is the one that has the money at the, at the moment. Okay, so now we want to see how this works in practice, and we can use the simulator for that. So if we go to the simulator, we click Send to Simulator, we can see we are asked for, for a few parameters. And these are the parameters that we saw in the contract. So the four timeouts, payment deadline, complaint deadline, response deadline, mediation deadline, and also the constant param with the price. And we can see that the timeout, timeouts are initialized to, to be increments. So this is the current time, this is 2 past 12, and have increments of 5 minutes, right? And this is the, 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 the price. So here we can put 100, for example. I have it already written because I've run it before, but you may have this empty at the moment. Okay, so once we have set the, the parameters for this particular execution of the contract, we can click Start Simulation, and then we can see the potential actions that the different parties can, can take. So this is kind of a godlike perspective, which allows us to see what every party sees. So the first stage is that the, the buyer is asked to deposit 100 ADA, which is the price. And if we click plus, then we simulate that this is what happens. You can see in the log here, the contract started, then the buyer deposited 100 ADA, and that it happened into the seller's account. And also you can see here in the current state, the list of accounts, now the seller's account has 100 ADA. So if the buyer now says everything is all right, then the account gets emptied and the contract pays the account of the seller to the seller 100 ADA. Because this is a simulator, we can go back in time, so we can click undo. And let's choose report a problem so that it's more interesting. So if the buyer reports a problem, then the seller is asked. You can also see that the contract has transferred from the account of the seller to the account of the buyer. And now the account of the buyer has 100 ADA. Another thing that we could do is simulate that the time advances and we reach the timeout, which in this case would be 17 minutes past. So if we click this, we can see that the buyer is paid. Again, we can undo. So let's say, let's say that the seller disputes the problem and then we go into the mediator and then we are going to do whatever the mediator says. So if we confirm the problem, then the buyer is paid, like we said. If we dismiss the claim, then the seller is paid. So that, that's basically the simulator. And before I leave you, I wanted to show you one more, one more feature of the playground, which is useful because it's very important for contracts to be correct, because if you make the, the, the contract wrong, then the money may go to the wrong place. Or, or maybe the contract will not behave as you expect it to behave. And, and this is usually quite important. And one tool that we have to avoid that is the static analysis. So if we run this, if we, the static analysis is a bit like the simulator, but it checks all possibilities So for, for any given parameter. So if we put here 100 ADA, 
and we run the analysis, we see that it passes, nothing goes wrong. But for example, here, imagine this payment. This payment, uh, here we have, um, we have that we are paying the same amount that we are depositing. But for example, if we modify this and we add one, we add one to the amount we want to pay. I'm going to put one million because here, because we don't have decimal values, we are assuming that this is, this actually means 1.00000. So I'm going to put this here. And if now we run the analysis, then it will find that actually we are trying to pay it 101. But there's only 100. And not only that, but the static analysis will tell you exactly what the execution is in order to get to that state. So it will tell you, well, the buyer deposited 100 ADA, then the buyer chose to report a problem, the seller disputed the problem, and then the mediator dismissed the claim. And then a payment was tried to, a payment was attempted that was trying to pay more money that there is available. So that's everything for this demo. Thanks for listening.